Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. In spite of all the books, the exposés, the articles that make patients think they are more knowledgeable than the doctors, the greatest mystery in our lexicon of science is still the human body. Murder, visitors from strange planets, the suspense of spectral visitors from the grave, none can compete with the simple but electrifying drama of the operating room. Ready, Dr. Schaefer? Ready, Dr. Marshall. Patients are all yours, then. Scalpel. McBurney incision, sir? Up to you. It's what I'd use, but I'm not the surgeon. You are, Dr. Schaefer. There's nothing to be afraid of? Not on your sweet... Uh, no, sir. Well, then, why don't you begin? <laughs> mystery drama, A Case of Negligence, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Mason Adams and Marion Seldes. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines, and Anheuser-Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser. I'll be back shortly with Act One. time I bring stories of death, spirits that rise from the grave, murder in every conceivable form, the torture of a man or woman knowing they are doomed, death which comes as it must to all men, death, the great mystery. This story is about those men most concerned with it and with life, the doctors, in particular the surgeons and the hidden danger they face. It begins appropriately enough in the clinic of a typical community hospital. You sit right there, Spud. Dad will be right back with the doctor. No big deal. I don't need a hospital. Cheer up. It's only an emergency ward. What you do, a uh, hand? Uh, get it caught in a cookie jar? Well... I guess you must have got roughed up by a tiger. No, I just got bit by Shadow. Who's that, a black leopard? A dog, Tommy. But he didn't mean it. Of course he didn't. Because dog is man's best friend. I'm only a little boy. A uh, boy's best friend, too. Then they won't do anything to him. Oh, no, why should they? When he didn't mean it... it... <laughs> You get bit, too? No. Just indigestion. Something old men get. I don't like to step out of line, Dr. Downing, but, uh, you know, with this sort of thing, it could be. I quite understand, Mr. Pollock. Of course we've had no cases of rabies reported. It was a, a neighbor's pet, but just to make sure... Excuse me. Uh, are you Mr. Clay? Uh, that's me, ma'am. I'm Dr. Downing. If you're not in any discomfort, this little boy's father is quite concerned I about... know, Doctor. Don't you worry about me. I'm used to living with pain after 75 years. You tend to spud. And uh, don't be too hard on Shadow. Shadow? Party of the second part, the dog. He didn't mean to do it. <laughs> if you'll take Spud into the first booth there, Mr. Pollock... Come on, son. We'll get you fixed up. Come on. Thanks, Mr. Clay. Yeah, I've got a grandson of my own. Know just how the boy feels. And I'm in no hurry. Well, we'll try not to keep you waiting too long. Uh, I'm all right. I... <laughs> what happened, Tom? I don't know, friend. The old man just collapsed. Why, that's Mr. Clay. Your patient? What's wrong with him? Well, when he came in, he just listed slight stomach disorder, indigestion, nothing to suggest an emergency. He certainly didn't act like there was one. I had this kid with a dog bite in the next booth, Will and you I... stay with the kid? Uh, I'll take you over. Maybe he just got a 
A little dizzy. They keep this place too hot anyway. No, not that hot. And he looks too rugged for anything that simple. Oh, don't worry about it. I'll check him out. Well, thanks for the helping hand, Tom. Mr. Clay? Yes? I'm Dr. Schaefer. Uh, feel up to a few questions? Sure. I'm all right. Uh, not quite. You just passed out. Well, almost. Oh, I had a bunch of cherry stones for dinner last night. <laughs> Dug them myself. Must have caught a bad one. Woke up with a real bellyache. Well, let's pin that down. E expose the abdomen, nurse. Well, what kind of ache? Uh, first off, I thought it was gas. It, kind of sharp. Then real dull. <laughs> hey, that don't feel so good. I'm not surprised. Um, draw some blood, nurse. I want a WBX stat. You feel it here? Here? Uh, How about here? <laughs> That's mighty tender. Mm-hmm. Well, let's get a little history on you. Okay, nurse, uh, get me that blood count. Green light. You live at uh, 17 Oakwood Lane, Mr. Clay? Well, uh, that's my home. Right now, I'm on the Janey. The what? My boat. Named after my wife. God rest her soul. A sloop rig built to myself. Well, how about that? You live on it alone? Yep. No family? Oh, yeah. Got a son, Dan. And his wife, Doris. And my grandson. Uh, they live in the house. Well, who sent you here? <laughs> if you mean a doctor, uh, don't have one. Never need one. Never get sick. <laughs> you have a cold now? I thought I shook it, but it hangs on. It'll go. But you haven't seen a doctor for it? Nope. Salt and soda, mustard plasters, and a steam kettle. Got me over every one I ever had. This one, too. Do you have a family physician? Told you, nope. Guess that makes you my doctor. I wish you'd lay off pressing on my belly. Sure does hurt. I'm sorry. I'm... Surprised you were able to move around as much as you did. How'd you get to the clinic? Drove. I was in town for supplies. Then, uh, driving back to the boat, uh, right near the hospital, I got a real Jim Dandy. Doubled me right over the wheel. Mm -hmm. Figured I'd better have someone take a look at it. Uh, you figured right. You know what's wrong with me, don't you, young fella? I can make a guess. Uh, acute vermiform appendix. That... Mean an operation? And the way it looks, I'd say yes. May I have the phone number at your house? Why? Just to notify your son and daughter-in-law. Don't bother them, unless you think I'm going to kick off. <laughs> the appendix isn't that much of a deal today. Well, even if it was, I don't think they'd worry anyways. <coughs> oh. <coughs> Look, what do you say we get this damn thing out? <laughs> it's beginning to bother me. <laughs> Superficial, Mr. Pollock. Keep the bandage clean and dry and come back next Friday. But supposing that dog had rabies? The dog will be checked out by the Board of Health. Right, right. If there's the slightest chance right. he has rabies, Spud will need shots, but there's no need to worry about right. that yet. Okay. We'll see you Friday. Well, isn't Dr. Gennano in attendance? A colectomy. And he won't be out for at least three hours. You better notify Dr. Marshall and have him schedule someone. I know that appendix has got to come out. What? Y yes, Clay. C-L-A-Y. C as in Charlie, which happens to be his first name. Oh, so that's what was the matter with Mr. Clay. Are you admitting him as a ward patient? I got to. He's in through the clinic, and he has no hospitalization. I, I tried to reach his son. He's in court arguing a case, and the son's wife is at a bridge game somewhere. <laughs> no family doctor? Nope. Says he's never been sick a day in his life. I can believe him. <laughs> oh, the old boy is as hard as nails. Well, I've got to get a more detailed history on him. Do you have to know all this guff about me? Well, you never know, and it might come in handy. And it fills in the time while I'm waiting for your blood count. Now, let me see now. 
All the kids' diseases, measles, German measles, scarlet fever. Never had one. Any allergies? No. Have you ever had a bad reaction to penicillin or aspirin? Or... <coughs> None. Unless that's one. That's your cold. Oh, that ain't what's bothering me, son. It's the pain in the gut. Oh, uh, the blood count, nurse. Good. Uh, let's see. White blood count, 15,000. Well, that clinches it. Get him undressed and we'll start to prep him. I'll be right back. You look kind of grim, Tom. Yeah. You got any consent forms in your desk, Franny? Sure. You going to operate? Uh, before that appendix pops. I meant, are you going to operate? Me? Are you kidding? No. You're a surgical resident now, aren't you? Well, sure. And I've assisted at enough surgical abdomens to do any of them in my sleep, but it's... Oh, it's up to Dr. Marshall to give me a nod, and if you think that G.I. ship-cracking tough son of a... I forgive my big mouth, Fran. I, I got to remember not to open it around the hospital. Mm, I hope you remember to forget. Here's your consent form. You better get it signed by a patient, because Dr. Marshall wants you upstairs in O.R. immediately. And that gives me butterflies in the stomach. But look at the hands, huh? <laughs> Steady as a rock. Well, Dr. Schaefer, you took your own sweet time about getting here. Well, as fast as I could, sir. I had to get a consent form from the patient. Did you get a history? Here, Dr. Marshall. Oh. A bit sketchy. What's the best I could do? This is red blanket, sir. The patient's already on his way up. Then you'd better scrub. And while you're changing, you can fill me in. Oh, yes, sir. How bad is this chest congestion? Bad enough to indicate a spinal. At your opinion? Or the anesthesiologist? He concurred, sir. I mean, that's what he would have recommended, so he agreed. And we're all in harmony. Except for the patient. He agree? He's in a lot of pain, sir. I, I had to sedate him. He was a bit foggy by the time we got to deciding on anesthesia. Yeah, I'd rather he knew. What about the relatives? Can't be reached. The switchboard will contact Dr. Downing if they call in. Well, it won't hurt to check with her before we scrub. Some people still have funny notions about spinals, no matter how safe they are. I'd like to have it part of the record. Dr. Downing? It's Dr. Marshall on this appendectomy out of your clinic. Any word yet from his son or daughter-in-law? Not a peep. Well, Dr. Schaefer and I are on our way up to the ready room now. If they turn up or call before we're out of scrub, let me know. You all set, doctor? All set. Then, let's go. Gloves, nurse. Uh, sir? Yes, Dr. Schaefer. Uh, excuse me, Dr. Marshall, but y you think there's anything wrong about this case? Not at all. Why? Well, I don't know. I, I just had a notion you... Uh, forget it. No, you're right in a way. When I found we were so shorthanded, I thought this case might be the perfect one to let you get your feet wet as a surgeon. Well, I'd like to, if you give me the chance. Think you can handle this, Schaefer? Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir, I do. I, I can promise you, you, you won't be sorry. Very well. The patient is yours once the anesthesiologist hands him over. May I have the patient, Dr. Davis? Thanks. Scalpel. McBurney incision, sir? Up to you. It's what I'd use, but I'm not the surgeon. You are, Dr. Schaefer. There's nothing you're afraid of? Not on your sweet... <laughs> no, sir. Now, why don't you begin? Your animal. Plants, please. Good. Face your scalpel. Swamp, please. Clamps. How'd it go, Brian? No problem. Ah, finally got in touch with Mr. Clay's daughter-in-law. She and her husband are on their way into the hospital, breathing fire. About what? Well, they felt they should have been consulted about the operation before it happened. Simple appendix. Why not... <coughs> Dr. Marshall. Yeah, yes, Dr. Schaefer. What? Respiratory failure. Why didn't you tell me sooner? No, I'll be right up. Mr. Clay? Yes. What? I don't know. Secondary result of the operation, perhaps. Oh, poor Tom. His first. It could be his last. 
I just have a miserable hunch your brother and I are in for a rough time. I hope we can keep you out of it. What trouble does Dr. Marshall anticipate after a simple operation? And what does he mean by your brother? And why, without the threat of murder or violence or any superhuman agency, does the shadow of death and mystery suddenly unfold its shadow over the people we have met and are still to meet? I'll return shortly with Act Two. the day before the two missing relatives of Charles Clay arrive at the hospital. Doris Clay is a triumph of cosmetics over nature. But if you look closely enough, the eyes are small and agate hard, the turn of the mouth downward and mean. Her husband Dan is heavy set, not with muscle, but by indulgence. His air of arrogance and assuredness is the armor he wears to cover his weakness. I'm sorry we had so much difficulty getting in touch with you both. I was in the middle of a bridge tournament. I don't know why the message didn't get to me. I was in court arguing a case, and naturally they didn't want to interrupt. And after all, it wasn't anything serious, was it? Just an acute appendicitis. Well, we don't have to waste any more time talking about it. I'd like to see my father. Well, that's why I met you and brought you to Dr. Marshall's office. Why? What's wrong? We were assured this was a very simple operation. Well, it seemed that way at the time, Mrs. Clay. And how does it seem now? There were some complications. If you'll excuse me, I'll let Dr. Marshall, the surgeon, and our chief of staff explain. I'll have him paged, and I'll send him right down. Well, isn't this just a dandy little mess? Take it easy, Doris. Take it easy. You should have been here to talk to your father before they operated. I was in court. I couldn't walk out in the middle of a case. But you could have walked out in the middle of a bridge case. I'm not his child. You are. I couldn't have persuaded him to change his will back. And even if I could, he'd have insisted on seeing you before he took any legal steps. You know that. No, I... He didn't consult me when he cut us out of his will. Well, he was angry at us then. Thank heaven enough has happened since that we're back in his good graces. We hope. Well, if we aren't, it's no fault of mine. I did everything I could to butter him up. Yeah, I've got to give you credit for that. Damn well right I did. Letting David spend half his time on that smelly old boat, cooking his clams and his seafood, even feeding that mangy old dog of his. Ugh, I could throw up when I think of it. But it may prove to have been worth it, baby. Even letting David bring that miserable apology for a dog back into our nice clean house because... Dan. What, dear? You said May. May have been worth it. Oh. When you had that talk with him day before yesterday, and you said he was coming home, you said he was going to change his will again yesterday, did he? Uh, I guess he didn't. What do you mean, you guess? His lawyer called me this morning while you were still asleep. Uh, he never kept the appointment. My Lord, you know what that means? If anything happens to him, we're... And we've got to get to him fast. Damn it, it was only a simple appendix. What the devil are you blowing a stack about? Maybe it's even better this way. We take him home to recuperate, and it'll be a lot easier to bring him around. I hope so. Because I'll tell you this. If he dies and doesn't leave us enough to clean up our debts, I'm walking out on you, Dan Clay. Mr. and Mrs. Clay? Yes. Who are you? I'm Dr. Schaefer. Dr. Marshall was concerned about keeping you waiting so long, and he asked me to come down and talk to you. We don't want to waste any more time. Both my husband and I want to see our father. I'm afraid you can't uh, for the moment. Why not? I'm sorry to tell you this, but um, he's gone into a coma. Coma? What? How? We haven't been able to diagnose it yet, Mr. Clay. Uh, the doctors don't even know? From what we can see, it has nothing to do with the operation It. Uh, Looks like an infection or an allergy of some kind. And what kind? Well, possibly a transverse myelitis. I mean, uh, an inflammation of the spine. What's the spine got to do with an appendicitis? Your father had a spinal anesthesia. 
It was necessary since he had a severe cold and a general anesthesia could have proven dangerous. Are you implying, Dr. Schaefer, that the spinal could have been a mistake? Not a mistake. But quite often a post-operative reaction like your father's might be due to an allergy. Do you know of any that he had? Didn't you ask Dad before you went ahead? Yes. But at the time, he was in so much pain, and we had him sedated so that... Oh, excuse me. Dr. Shaver. Tom, it's Fran. Are the Clays still with you? Yes. Try not to alarm them, but I think you'd better bring them up here. Brian asked me to call. It's Mr. Clay. What about him? He's gone into convulsions. I see. Well, thank you, Doctor. Uh, we'll be right up. Is that about my father? Well, yes. Uh, Dr. Marshall just sent a message for me to take you upstairs to his room. Oh, then he is conscious. I'm afraid not. Not yet. Shall we go? The elevator's right outside the door. You were asking about allergies, Dr. Schaefer. A question, of course, you should have asked my father. I did. He said he had none. That he'd never been sick a day in his life. Just a big front he kept up. He was always getting colds, and he had trouble with his teeth. But you couldn't get him near a dentist. You remember why, Doris? Four years ago when he had the tooth pulled? I'm not likely to forget. Oh, he had a terrible reaction to the Novocaine. We thought that... Do you use Novocaine with spinal? No, but we do use a related drug. And you didn't ask my father if he was susceptible to it? Mr. Clay... Your father denied having any allergies. But you didn't check further. We tried to reach both of you, but we couldn't, as you know. And it was an emergency. Seems to me it still is. Because it's looking more and more that somebody did make a mistake. Damn serious one. Which door is my father's? Uh, number 814. The one where my sister... I mean, uh, Dr. Downing is standing. Your sister? But your name is Schaefer. She uses her married name. Dr. Marshall is in with your father now, if you wouldn't mind waiting just a moment. I don't know about Dan, but I'm getting tired of this runaround. I don't intend to be kept waiting any longer. It's urgent that oh, I see... Oh, here's Dr. Marshall now. This is Mr. Oh, Mr. So you do exist. Well, I demand that I be allowed to talk with my father immediately. I am afraid that's no longer possible, Mr. Clay. What do you mean? Very sorry to have to tell you, Mrs. Clay... You, Mr. Clay, but your father's just passed away. Oh, uh, uh, good uh, that's Lord, impossible. no. A fine old man in, in perfect health with everything to live for us, his grandson. No man is in perfect health after an operation. And besides... But we were led to believe it was a very simple operation. It was, Mrs. Clay. A classic appendectomy done in less than half an hour. No complications, no rupture. The appendix was in no way obstructed. The surgeon was able to see it clearly, detach it, and remove it without yeah, any... Just a, just a minute. The surgeon, you said? Yeah. I thought you were the surgeon, Dr. Marshall. I was the surgeon in charge, but the procedure was actually handled by a resident. Just what is a resident, Dr. Marshall? A qualified physician who is training in surgery. What you're saying, Doctor is that you allowed my father to be operated on by a novice? I'm saying nothing of the sort. I want his name. I want to know who he is. I did the operation, Mr. Clay. You? I think you must be mad, Dr. Marshall. Why, this, this boy scarcely looks any older than my 15-year-old son. Dr. Marshall, I want the answer to only one question. I want to know if the operation was performed so classically, why my father died. I wish I could answer that. We haven't been able to determine the causes yet. Oh, you're not willing to admit them. We have nothing to hide, Mr. Clay. Have you? Just exactly what is it you're after? Causes, Doctor. Would you like me to list a few? Since you're not a physician, it seems purposeless. Your opinion wouldn't have much validity. I'm an attorney, Doctor. And my opinion has considerable validity in a court of law. Doris, get the elevator. Yes, Dan. We're leaving now, Dr. Marshall. Mr. Clay, before you do, there are certain arrangements. You can trust me to handle those. You'll be notified. I had wanted you to sign one document. What? For all our sakes, I think a post-mortem examination is indicated. Oh, for my dead body, if you want to add that to my father's. The elevator's here. I hope it's more efficient than the staff at this hospital. 
I'm sorry, Dr. Marshall. For what, Doctor? For... Well, if you want me to really be honest, mostly because a swell old guy I like died for no reason I can think of. I, I just hope it wasn't my fault. Well, how could it be? Just the anesthetic, We'll but... talk this all out later. Dr. Schaefer, grab a staff elevator and get down and make sure the clays are off our turf for the moment. And then meet me in my office. Check, sir. On my way. Brian, it wasn't his fault, was it? No, I don't think so. If there is any blame, and it rests on a lot of shoulders, it has to do with us all being human beings. What does that mean? A nice but stubborn old man who wouldn't admit age or infirmity. A doctor approaching middle age who lost his wife and fell in love with another man. And a rapacious pair of people who don't deserve the title of human being who had little love for a nice old guy until suddenly he died mysteriously. Why? I don't know about them. Only about us. I'm married to a husband who should have been a retired racehorse. <laughs> He's a natural stud. He won't divorce me or allow a divorce, and I won't force it because we do have a daughter who adores her father. And I'd rather break my heart than hers. And my wife is dead. I thought I'd never love another woman. And now I do. There's nothing I can do about it. Oh, darling. Oh, darling. Let us go for a moment. The other thing's more immediate, isn't it? There was two awful people. They're going to sue, aren't they? I'd guess that's what they have in mind. And if they ever got wind of us, they could crucify Tom. And us. And the hospital, perhaps. How can we stop them? An autopsy is the best answer. We can force that. If it vindicates what Tom and I have done, that's that. And if it doesn't? We could all be up the creek... Without a paddle. The Doctor's Dilemma. There is no more demanding or exacting and exhausting preparation for any profession. But there is still a small percentile of accident no human being can possibly foresee or devise against. Man proposes, but God still disposes. I'll return shortly with Act Three. Flood, famine, death, or whatever, Doris Clay rises late in the morning. It is one of her completely selfish indulgences she allows nothing to interfere with. Even this morning, which could well be one of the most important in her life, she is barely coming to with the help of black coffee propped up in the big bed with the satin sheets as Dan, who is an early riser, comes to join her just before noon. Oh, you look like the wrath of God. I feel like it. My nose isn't any good. I got the chapman, Dad's lawyer. Fat old fool. But I've seen the will. And? The bulk of his estate is left in trust for David. Hedged in so tight we couldn't even borrow, beg, steal, or finagle a nickel. And the rest? <laughs> it might be ironically funny if, if we weren't personally involved. The rest of it goes to the hospital. A gift from someone who didn't believe in doctors. Um, he only did it to hurt us. Dan, not a penny. Not unless we break it. Can we? It's a fallback position. I don't know if it's worth the investment. There's a much easier way out of our troubles. There's got to be some way. We're in debt up to our ears. And we can't hold it off any longer. I know. I think we have a good chance for at least a settlement. We're going to sue for malpractice. Who? The doctors, of course. At least Marshall must have insurance. But most of all, because clinic and a resident physician are involved, the hospital. That's where the real dough is. Come in, Dr. Marshall. Uh, you know, 
Mr. Clay. Yes, Mr. Wyatt. Mr. Clay is here at my instigation to see if we can't smooth out our differences amicably. I see no reason why we can't. I'm certainly reluctant to damage the reputation of this hospital for just one tragic mistake. If we can keep things quiet. What are you getting at? Well, until he sold out a little over a year ago, my father was pioneer furniture. One of the wealthiest and most influential men in the state. If the papers should pick up any hint that his death was, uh, well, you know, headlines, sell newspapers... Pick up what? There's no story for them here. Well, isn't there? Even you doctors admit my father's death is an enigma. Doesn't have to be. If you want to render more than lip service, what does that mean? Give us permission to perform an autopsy. Huh. Haven't you mutilated him enough? You say you don't want to hurt any reputations. But you don't want to protect them either. I want my father to rest in peace. Mr. Clay, we're both lawyers. Why fight an autopsy? You know, under the circumstances, any court would grant an order to perform one. My object in coming here today was to keep this out of court. Meaning you want a settlement. Well, the wrong has been done. You can't prove that without an autopsy. It is the truth you want, isn't it? Of course. All right. Give me the paper and I'll sign it. How soon will we get results? By tomorrow morning. No. Very well. Then we'll know exactly where we all stand. Come in. Good morning, Brian. You've got one of these too, Fran? Hmm, a subpoena. I never had one before. You're a part of your company. You, me, Tom, Dr. Davis, and the hospital. The moment the results of the post-mortem were in. But it was negative. I mean, cause of death unknown. It didn't prove any of us responsible. <sighs> Unfortunately, it didn't prove that any or all of us weren't. There's one easy way out of this. What? I resign as chief of staff, take the blame, and make the best settlement with Clay that I can out of court. But why would you do a thing like that? None of us is guilty of anything. He has no case. Darling, the danger here is you and me. But we haven't done anything wrong. No, I'm rather sorry to say. No sin of commission. <sighs> but a hospital is like a school or a small village. And the grapevine trembles in the slightest wind. If Dan Clay got any notion that you, a married woman, have any concern for me, and that I, because Tom is your brother, made any special consideration to allow him to operate... But you've done just the opposite. You've almost held him back because of that conscience of yours. I know that, my darling. You know. But does the rest of the world, long before all of this happened, I've been trying to face the fact that I should go away and leave you to... To Alec. In and out of any other bed he can find. Oh, no. You don't walk out because of me. Maybe it's time to get it all out in the open anyway. I can't protect my daughter much longer. She's getting old enough to know about her father. And we can take it as long as we know we're right. We are, aren't we, darling? As God is my judge, I believe so. Then what killed that poor old man? Nothing we did. I'm sure of it. The question is, how can I prove it? Dr. Marshall. Yes, Mr. Wyatt. I know. Yeah, yes, yes, of course. I, I can't promise that we can't. I know, sir. Much better. I have Dr. Downing with me now. I'll round up the others and join you in your office. What was that? Mr. Wyatt wants us, Tom and Dr. Davis, up in his office. He's gotten Clay to agree to a pre-court hearing. It's worth a try to keep this thing from getting out of hand. Just a quick explanation of what an examination before trial consists of. Uh, this is Mr. Cooper, who's a court stenographer. He will take a complete transcript of everything said here, just as in a court of law. Though there is no judge present here, everyone will receive the full transcript, and you'll be bound by oath to whatever statements they make. Uh, all right, Mr. Clay. Thank you, Mr. Wyatt. Dr. Downing. You admitted my father to the clinic? I signed him in, yes. 
Uh, did you bring a copy of the roster for that evening as requested? I did. Was there a patient named Spud Pollock on that roster? Yes. But according to this, he was on the fourth in order after Charles Clay, and yet he was taken ahead of him. Well, the child had been bitten by a dog. It was an emergency. And an acute appendix is well, not... at the time, I wasn't aware that... How could you be since you hadn't asked? I submit that it was gross negligence. Being negligence not... has not been established. Let it also be noted that Charles Clay did have an acute appendix and subsequently died the very next day. Now, as I understand it, Dr. Schaefer, you were the one who diagnosed acute appendix? I did. And you recommended an immediate operation? Correct. For which some form of general anesthetic is used. Not in this case. The patient appeared to have an upper respiratory infection, so Dr. Davis, the anesthesiologist, and I agreed that a spinal was the safest to use. Did my father sign a consent for the operation? Yes. And he was told about the spinal? At the time he signed the consent, uh, it had not been decided on. So he was never told? Well, he was in great pain and under sedation by the time it was agreed on. Were you aware that Mr. Clay was allergic to Novocaine? I asked him if he had any allergies. He said no. Just general allergies or what, Doctor? There wasn't time to go into it in detail. There was risk of the appendix rupturing. If and... an appendix ruptures, is it usually fatal? Not by any means. But in this but... case, it didn't. Still, the patient died. Why? Do you know? You know we don't. Dr. Marshall, I received a copy of the autopsy report. Quote, death by respiratory failure and or cardiac arrest due to cause or causes unknown. Unquote. That doesn't rule out an allergic reaction to the anesthesia, does it? No, but... And when my father was examined before the operation, there was no indication of any other serious condition other than the inflamed appendix? That's substantially correct. So what will you say in court, Doctor, when I ask, would Charles Clay have died if there had not been an operation? Uh, don't answer that, Dr. Marshall. We'll wait till or if we get to court to argue that. You are married, Mr. Clay? I am. Any children? One. A boy. David. Were you and your father close? Yes. We were a very close family. So your only reason for bringing suit is to punish the parties you deem responsible for the death of your father? Correct. And any money you might be awarded is secondary, of course. It's of no object. I see. Your father didn't live in the same house with you. Mm -hmm. No. Where did he live? In an old boat he built. Why? He liked that kind of life. Even in a freezing winter he thought was too much for his dog to stand? Dad was getting old. We like to indulge his whims. That's what he wanted, so we gave in. It wouldn't be that he was tired of indulging your whims and paying your debts. Did your father leave a will? Well, you know he did. You subpoenaed a copy of it. But he was going to change it. <laughs> a blow for the hospital it would have been, wouldn't it, to lose all that bequest? I won't even dignify that with an answer. I want to read only one part. I bequeath and trust to my grandson, David, all the rest of my property, real or otherwise, etc., etc. And I charge him and or his trustees to maintain until his death my friend Whiskey. He and David have given me the only love I ever knew. Whiskey? My father's dog. We've been taking care of him. Better than your father, I hope. Whiskey was old and sick. He had to be put away. A deliberate act, Counselor. Not like my father, who was lost through negligence. What is it, Brian? Are we alone? Yes. I just came from a long talk with Wyatt. I've handed him my resignation. Oh, no. Why? The only way. 
Wyatt had Clay backed against the wall at one point, and he really opened up and threatened to fight dirty. He's so desperate. He'd ruin Tom's career and yours. Mine? His wife. A prize harpy, and also something of a swinger. Apparently knows your husband. In return for all the phony dirty could hand her about us, she promised to make sure they discredit you enough in an open trial so he could get custody of your child. Well, I'm not going to let you sacrifice yourself for me and Tom. It isn't only that. The old man did go into convulsive seizure before he died. Now, with that on the books, and considering the vicious, rabid prosecution Dan Clay would put on in court, the press coverage... Rabid. What is it? That kid with the dog bite. Charles Clay's old dog. Francis, maybe I just found the answer. We've got to have another post-mortem. The second autopsy, Mr. Clay, when we knew what we were looking for, lists final proof. In the corneal monis, the characteristic inclusion bodies of Negri were found. In Lane's terms, your father died of rabies. Which he got from his dog, Whiskey. But the dog never had convulsions. There are two forms. The furious and the dumb. In the second, the dog is just lethargic and comatose. He looks old. Well, uh, my father never was bitten. The saliva of the dog, when someone fondled him, if there was any break in the skin whatsoever, would have been enough to infect him. You're just lucky you had that dog put away before he infected your son, Dan. Now, uh, get out of here before I give you a valid case to prosecute. Assault and battery. Well, that's the end of that. And the beginning of us. What do you mean? Oh, I'm just realizing that I'm the one who's really guilty of gross negligence. Brian, my darling, you think you can forgive me? I don't know. I'll spend a lifetime trying. No gothic tale of horror, certainly. No murders. No horrendous, tortured spirits rising from the grave. But a mystery story. And a story of jeopardy more important than most. For a doctor's good name must, like Caesar's wife, Always be above reproach. I'll be back shortly. A few footnotes to a compelling story. First, that the doctors were vindicated. Second, to applaud the depth of a surgeon's knowledge that enabled him to make such a rare diagnosis. Once he had the facts. Last, a word about old Charles Clay. Though today, rabies, if caught in time, can be cured. Once the symptoms develop, death is inevitable. So, somewhere, Charles can perhaps take heart knowing his death achieved one thing. It brought a happy life to two people who might have let it slip through their fingers. So... At the end, this was a love story. Our cast included Mason Adams, Marion Seldes, Bob Caliban, Alan Hewitt, Hetty Galen, and Gil Mack. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. With shaking hands, I measured a very small portion in a cup of hot water and took it down the hall to my uncle's bedroom. Oh. It's all right, my dear. Oh. Oh. I wanted to spare you for a little while. But you'd see it sooner or later. I couldn't believe I was seeing it then. The walls and floor were black. And so was the big bed with a prow like a Viking ship. My uncle looked like a ghost propped up against those white pillows. And thank God, John had warned me because there, on one side of the bed, was that coat rack thing from which dangled a full-size skeleton. Don't be frightened, my dear. You'll soon get used to everything around here. 
Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Anheuser Busch Incorporated, Brewers of Budweiser, and Sinoff, the Sinus Medicines. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>